So uh, from, from her very early days of making waves to an ongoing and enduring, and enduring voice urging women to action, um, from a, a long friendship that she's had with the YWCA um, as a supporter and a contributor to uh, our work. Can you please join me in welcoming Anne Summers to address us on why women should. I come encumbered with all sorts of things. And unfortunately, not this morning, the red lipstick. I did think about it and thought it was a bit early in the day <laughs> and it is Canberra um, and that maybe I should, you know, adjust the, um, the, the clothing a little bit and be a little more serious. Um, so I'm not, not by any means trying to say that you can't be glamorous in Canberra, but I do wonder about it at 8.30 <laughs> in the morning. You know, I usually save the red lipstick for after lunch. <laughs> now my iPad won't open. Oops. Let's cancel, start again. Great. Um, I guess I'm here today to, to, as one of those elders that um, Auntie Agnes talked about, somebody who um, has certainly been around for an overly long time and who uh, therefore has many different lives um, to draw on in, 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 in what I might be able to share with you. Um, I'm in the, in the fortunate position now of not having a job, um, but it doesn't mean that I don't work. I think I've never worked harder in my life than I do at the moment because I've taken on a new career, as somebody, some of you may know. I decided to, to start my own magazine about 15 months ago, and um, that's going really strong. And I also decided to create some events, and you might probably be aware of the first one I did, which was with former Prime Minister Julia Gillard, at a, my first event at the Opera House, the first time I've ever appeared on the stage of the Opera House was with Julie Gillard in front of 2,680 people. I know, because I counted the, the seats as they came in and look, wow, here's this money pouring in. We'll be able to keep the magazine going for a few more months. <laughs> um, so I was, I was very kind of um, business-like in my approach to that. Um, so doing these things is, is, is what I now do. And the great thing about it um, is the independence and the self reliance uh, that comes from, from being your own boss. The downside of it is you don't get paid and uh, therefore um, you, know, you are dependent on other people to make, sh make sure you earn enough money to keep going. So um, I, I bring all these various things to you. I do have some brochures here for the magazine which you can have a look at later if you're interested because I would like to share with you what I'm doing. But what I thought I'd do this morning is try uh, in a perhaps sub somewhat oblique way share with you those experiences, because I see um, that my task this morning as introducing this conference is to help set the scene for the work that you'll be doing during the rest of the day. And so I'm going to suggest a couple of ideas. Some of them might seem a little bit provocative, or at least I hope they will, um, because I believe that we all need to be constantly challenged if we're to keep our brains supple and in good shape, our brains, of course, being the essential tool for what it is we do with life. But before I begin, I think it's just worth restating um, what I regard as the three fundamental principles of women's equality. Because without these, we have nothing. And these three uh, fundamental um, principles are number one, economic self-reliance, number two, control of our bodies, and number three, uh, freedom from violence. Sadly, it's necessary for us to continually restate these fundamentals because they are still not present or where they do exist, they are not fully realised or they are not embedded. For women to be self-reliant economically, we must have access to the best education that we are capable of absorbing. On this score, as the current World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report uh, points out, Australia does quite well. In fact, we're equal number one around the world in terms of women's education achievement. But on top of that, you know, w having the education is one thing, what do we do with it is the next thing. So we need to have access to employment, to equal wages and to progress throughout our careers to the highest ranks that we wish to go to. None of these opportunities are available to Australia, Australian women as a matter of entitlement. Our work for workforce participation rate is just under 60% and most of that is part-time work and we're still paid only around 83% of men's earnings. 
This means, of course, that over a lifetime, women earn a lot less than men. It's in fact been calculated uh, here in Canberra by NatSem that a 25-year-old <coughs> postgraduate female student starting employment today will, over the course of her lifetime, uh, working lifetime, earn $1 million, $1 million less than the 25-year-old man who starts work the same day she does. Even today, you can still do quite a lot with a million dollars. Our lesser earnings, or I could anyway, our lesser earnings together with our interrupted work patterns as a result of childbearing and raising means we retire with a lot less money than men. And then of course, we live longer. You do the maths. The second fundamental principle for women's equality is that we retain control of our bodies, that we decide when and whether we are going to have children. Now today, while most Australian women can access contraception, our ability to resort to abortion, should that be necessary, is still under constant threat. The latest assault on our freedom of choice is in Victoria, where an independent MP is threatening to, in effect, bring down the government if the state's abortion laws are not drastically tightened. And in New South Wales, there is legislation pending that if passed, would confer personhood personhood on the foetus. This has the potential to reduce women's rights to abortion. Access to abortion is also reduced by the constant stigmatising of the issue. Look what happened last year. It's not even a year ago. I'm referring to June the 11th, 2012, when Julia Gillard warned us with great prescience, as it turns out, that men in blue ties would try to restrict access to abortion. I'm quoting her here. We don't want to live in an Australia where abortion again becomes a political plaything of men who think they know better, she said less than a year ago. She was roundly attacked for this, including by many women, including a number of self-styled feminists who argued that she was being divisive. Now, why is it divisive to talk about a threat to women's reproductive choice? The answer is that the whole subject of abortion has become so stigmatised that few people want to talk about it, let alone fight for it. This has serious repercussions for every aspect of service provision in this country, including the fact that most abortion providers are in their 60s and are not being followed by younger doctors willing to provide this essential service. So what does it matter if abortion is legal if there's no one willing to perform the service? That's an aspect of abortion in this country that is very rarely talked about. And I, in fact, first heard this very startling information at a, another one-day conference in Canberra a couple of years ago when this wonderful woman from Children by Choice from Queensland talked about this. And she said there is nobody in Queensland providing abortion. I think she said one person in Queensland, the entire state of Queensland, aged, over, aged under 60, who is providing abortions. And that, to me, the demographic implications of that are something we need to be as mindful of as we are monitoring what's happening to the law. And thirdly, and very, very sadly, we are not free while so many of us are subject to violence. We know that the recent increases in murders as a result of domestic violence have been so numerous that there are now calls for an, an emergency national summit to address the subject. Now, I agree that this should happen. In fact, it's long overdue. But I'm saddened by the fact that it has taken the death of a large number of children for the call to be made. Women's deaths are not serious enough, despite the fact that one a week in this country is murdered to warrant a similar call. These, then, are the three fundamental principles that need to be accepted for women to have true equality. These are the underpinnings of what we do. To attain or protect these principles in the current political environment, I am suggesting we need to take action in the following way. So this is where I become very prescriptive. The five things that I think you have to do. I'm going to summarise them and then I'm going to address each one of them in some detail. First of all, have a little sip of coffee. <laughs> So, number one, stop calling Tony Abbott the Minister for Women. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Number two, oppose Tony Abbott's paid parental leave scheme. 
No clapping. Okay. Three, support numerical enforceable targets for women's representation in leadership positions in private and public spheres, parliament, the government, including the cabinet boards, and most importantly, senior management. Four, retain gender reporting and the Women's Gender Equality Agency. And five, work together as women to protect our interests. Okay, in detail. Number one, stop calling Tony Abbott the Minister for Women. Now, I am sick to death of people, particularly on Twitter, mocking Tony Abbott by referring to him as the Minister for Women. I do not agree with many of Mr Abbott's policies. In fact, I can think of only one that I really agree with, and that's got nothing to do with women. Uh, but I do support his decision to move responsibility for women's policy back to the Prime Minister's department, thereby potentially returning the power and prestige it used to enjoy during the Hawke and Keating governments. I was always very disappointed that both Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard left women's policy languishing in Faxia, thereby designating it effectively an area of welfare rather than a central whole of government policy. Both Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, and I worked for both of them, had ministers assisting the Prime Minister on what used to be called the status of women. We've dropped the status part of it now. It's just the Minister for Women, which again is sad. But the fact that both Bob Hawke and Paul Keating were the Prime Minister and had ministers assisting them on women did not make either of these men the Minister for Women. And to my knowledge, no one ever called them that. So why are we doing it now? Mocking Abbott in this way is so fashionable these days, but it's politically short-sighted as well as being factually incorrect. Let's stop it and instead ask whether the Office for Women is being listened to, the far more important issue here. How much influence do they have? Are they able, as OSW, the Office of the Status of Women, as it used to be called, and I, I ran it for a certain number of years during the Hawke government, are they able, as OSW certainly did in my day, are they able to comment on every single cabinet submission and let cabinet know the impact on women of purchasing the new defence fighters or you know, opening Badgeries Creek Airport? We weren't just asked to comment on the welfare girly stuff, we were asked to comment on everything. Because if you take a whole of government approach to women's policy, everything matters. Everything has an impact one way or another. For example, if you're going to um, you know, put a new um, defence base up in the um, Northern Territory somewhere, are you, as I asked a, def a, a defence officer once, are you going to be providing brothels? And he nearly fell off his chair. Um, or are you going to have married, fam married quarters? You know, it, what's it going to be, boys? Because it's going to be one or the other, let's be real. That's the sort of conversation that we should be involved with, not just quarantined over in welfare. So I would hope that OSW, or o OFW as it's now called, um, would have the opportunity to comment on every cabinet submission. I don't know if they can or not, and I'm not going to get them into trouble by ringing any of them and asking them, because we know that um, you're, many of you, I suspect, are public servants, and so you know that if a journalist rings you, you have to report it. So I don't want to put anyone in, in that office in that position. So we don't, I don't anyway, know exactly what they are doing or, and how much access they have. But you would certainly hope that they got to see the submissions and that they, certainly, and that they would have opposed, for example, the removal of the low income superannuation contribution, whose impact we know, uh, if it's confirmed in tonight's budget, uh, will be mainly on women, as will the Medicare co-payment and many other measures this government um, uh, uh, from this government and, th and in tonight's budget are likely to have a disproportionate and detrimental effect on women. So this should be the scandal that women are being made to suffer more under this government, that policy is not being designed to help women. In some instances, it could be argued it is designed to do exactly the opposite, which brings me to my second women should oppose Tony Abbott's paid parental leave scheme. Now, Mr Abbott's scheme, a very expensive scheme, has been rightfully criticised for the fact that it will not deliver what he claims is the principal re reason for its existence, and that is to increase women's workforce participation. We all know, and there are numerous studies done on this, but the one I can refer you to is the Grattan Institute's 
um, a very good report called Game Changers a couple of years ago, we all know that the two key barriers to women returning to work is the availability and cost of childcare and the loss of income due to the high effective marginal tax rates on family benefits, on the withdrawal of family benefits. If Mr Abbott has $5 billion to spare, he would be better off spending it to address these two issues and he would have more success in achieving his stated aim. This is what Canada did in the late 1990s, which is the case study reported by the Grattan Institute report that I just mentioned. But given the evidence and given that the existing PPL scheme, you wouldn't know that we actually have one that's working, 400,000 400, women and 40,000 men have taken advantage of it in the last three years, yet no one ever talks about it. This existing scheme is working quite well. It has its flaws. It should, you know, it should attract super, in my opinion, so it could be fixed. It will cost a lot less than $5 billion to fix it. But the fact that um, Mr Abbott wants to persist with his, with his PPL in the face of the fact that the existing scheme is working, you have to question his motives for persisting with his scheme in the face of almost universal opposition. I'm not the only person to have suggested that what he really wants is to get women, especially those he has dubbed women of calibre, out of the workforce. The fact that his scheme will be administered by Centrelink rather than paid by the employer, as is the current scheme is, gives some credence to this idea. And I can talk about this for the rest of the day, but I know we have to move on. So number three, um, I think women should support numerical um, enforceable targets. Um, Mr Abbott has set a shocking precedent uh, with his cabinet. With just one woman, this is the lowest representation of women in Australia's top decision-making body since the Keating years. So that's going back to the early 1990s, when at least there was the excuse that the pool of women to draw on was pitifully tiny. And that is not something that we can argue today. I just want to quickly go through the figures, and I'm sorry I don't have a slide. I'm not very good in this technical department. But I just want to go through the composition of the last few governments and just to sort of draw the contrast. If we go back to the last Howard ministry, which was in 2006, overall 16.7% of his cabinet were women. So in cabinet, it was two out of 18, which was equals 11%. The overall ministry, two out of 12, which represents 16.7%. And he had three out of 12 parliamentary secretaries equals 25%. Overall, 16.7% of Howard's government was women. I can see some of you typing away really quickly, so that's great. The last Gillard Ministry, 2013, remember that is still less than a year ago, overall 33%, the highest in our history. She had four out of her 20 cabinet ministers were women, 20%. Six out of 10 ministers were women, 60%. Four out of 12 parliamentary secretaries equals 33%. Julia gets the gold star. The last Rudd ministry in 2013, overall 31%. Cabinet, six out of 20, was 30%. Ministry, five out of 10, 50%. Parliamentary secretaries, two out of 12, 17%. What do we have today? The first Abbott ministry, overall 14%. 14%. So it's less than half of Rudd's and less than half of Gillard's. One out of 19 cabinet ministers, 5%. Four out of 11 of the ministry, that's 36%. But the real shocker, the real shocker are the parliamentary secretaries, because this is the pipeline, the pipeline to higher, to higher management, well, management, anyway, the pipeline to the higher positions is the parliamentary secretary. This is where you, you know, you have your training wheels on, this is where you learn how to be a minister. One out of the 12 parliamentary secretaries is a woman, that's 8%, and that person in particular is widely um, portrayed as being on the way out, not on the way up. Speaks volumes, Tony. Now, the rest of the world can do it. The French cabinet comprises 50% women. And just yesterday, I saw in the article in the New York Times that showed me that the recently elected mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, is setting new records with his appointments and not just on gender. Although, with 32 women appointed to senior positions in his administration as against 28 men, that's 53% women, he's doing a lot better than anyone in this country. But the other example we should be looking to is the age of his appointees. 
We are, according to media reports, going to learn tonight in the federal budget that the pension age is to be raised to 70. Employers need to start taking heed of this and start hiring and retraining workers way beyond their current preference for people under 50. Mayor de Blasio's new administration includes a number of women who are in their late 60s. And his school chancellor, Carmen Farina, was brought back from retirement at the age of 71 to take on the job. So there should be more of that. With government setting such a bad example in Australia, is it any wonder that women's representation in the corporate world is also pretty woeful? It's good to see that the, that the proportion of women comprising new ASX 200 board appointments continues to rise from the pitiful 5% that it was in 2009 to a record 29% so far this year. And there's very good stats on this. Those, many of you probably already know this. If you go to the Australian Institute of Company Directors website and down the bottom, very bottom of, of it, there's a thing called statistics. If you go on there, they do live uh, in uh, real-time updates of the number of appointments uh, by number, by percentage, by everything. It's a fantastic resource for anyone who's interested in tracking this stuff. And so far this year, we're up to 29%, um, which is the highest we've ever had. But we are still nowhere near the 40% that Norway and some other European countries have adopted in order to rapidly increase the representation of women. And as the AICD also points out, there are still 40 out of the ASX 200 companies that have no women. So that's almost 20% of our companies have no women in 2014 and they think that's okay. So we need to be clear about one thing. Without enforceable numerical targets, let's cut the crap and call them quotas, um, we, we are not going to see permanent and noticeable change. At present, as we've seen in politics, the appointment of women is a matter of whimsy. If the bloke in charge feels like doing it, he will. Or in the current case, he didn't. We have to move beyond whimsy to regulation just as we do with every other goal that we are serious about attaining. Having quotas of at least 40% will, as Sex Discrimination Commissioner Elizabeth Broderick has pointed out, she's very, very persuasive on this subject, it will force employers to canvas the available talent. It will require them to take merit into account. This does not happen at present. Merit is the last thing many employers look for. Instead, they use networks, mates, old school, footy clubs, or any other number of random means of rec recruiting people who, kill surprise, end up being very much like themselves. It's ludicrous to argue that after 30 years of women graduate, women's graduating from Australian universities in equal or greater numbers than men, that there is not an equal distribution of merit and talent in this country. So why is this not reflected in the ranks of our leadership in politics, in business, in public administration? We have had 40 years of saying we're going to do this. We haven't done it voluntarily. We now need some compulsion. So my fourth thing that women should do, and I know we can't do this on our own, but we have to fight for it, we have to ensure that, that the government retains the gender reporting and the Women's Gender Equality Agency. Because just as we need quotas to achieve results, we need gender reporting to check on our progress. The private sector has begun doing this. They've got a benchmarking scheme that was set up by the ASX in 2010. And under its corporate governance guidelines, all listed companies are required to report on the numbers of women in their organisations, on their boards and in their senior management teams. In doing this, the ASX led the way, astonishingly, and they are to be congratulated for doing that. The Labor government had been inexcusably slow to redress the damage done by the Hawke government to the Howard government, sorry, by the, ha excuse me, stop that again. The Labor government of Rudd and Gillard had been inexcusably slow to redress, redress the damage done by the Howard government to the Hawke government's reporting requirements that were set up under the 1986 affirmative action legislation. Now, the rather little and almost too late measures legislated at the last minute by the Labor government in the Women's Gender Equality Act are under threat from the Abbott government. This government's initial effort to end the gender reporting requirements, just as they were about to be implemented, was fortunately stymied 
by some pretty effective lobbying by women's and other groups. But the law and the agency that administered it, administers it is still on the government's hit list. We need to fight to save the law and to protect the agency. As they say in business, what gets measured gets noticed. It was no mistake that the Howard government systematically abolished every single form of measurement of women's activity and women's progress. From the Women's Bureau that had been set up by the Menzies government back in 1963 to monitor women's employment, especially equal pay, to the Women's Statistic Unit in the Australian Bureau of Statistics. All these gone and many, many other areas that I can think of, including the women's desks in every department. If we're not measured, we don't know how we're doing. It's imperative that we have markers of progress or lack of it or of backsliding. The government that abolishes these ways of measurement knows this and that's why they do it. Finally, women should work together. We, we, as women, we must work together to fight for our rights, to protect what we have won and to resist any further attempts to send us back to the dark ages. As I have often argued, we need a strong, independent and effective women's lobby. Why should it just be the miners, the farmers, the trade unions and so on who are able to have powerful lobbies in Canberra? Women need this too. In the meantime, we must support the groups that are taking a stand. Fair Agenda, the National Foundation for Women, for Australian Women, the Women's Electoral Lobby and other groups. We must be ready to support them, particularly with our money as well as with our voices. The only way we can ensure our independence and hence our effectiveness is to end our reliance on government funding. We have seen too often how governments of both persuasions have been quite ruthless about using funding as a weapon and a tool. We must leave those days behind us. And in saying that, I'm not trying to make things difficult for our host. We know the YWCA does an extraordinary job and does uh, rely uh, to some extent on uh, government money, but it too uh, knows uh, the hard road that that often means one must tread and how it can, in fact, sometimes circumscribe what you want to do. So to conclude, what I've tried to do this morning is to be prescriptive. Women should, I say. You may not agree, agree with each of the things that I prescribe, but I trust that you take seriously the need for us to be vigilant, active and effective when it comes to fighting for and protecting our rights to be equal members of this society. Thank you. <laughs>